My name is Russell Chatham, and huh, my job is to paint pictures. <laughs> well, by all accounts, perhaps a pretty odd um, occupation. Um, it's, it's not a job in the traditional sense, uh, one which I started, uh, started out having other artists in the family painting when I was like seven, eight years old. But it is what I suppose you'd have to say I was born to do. And so um, I didn't have a choice. I didn't choose it, it chose me. A tremendous amount of natural ability. I mean, he could draw beautifully. And he was very, he was very, Sensitive. I mean, he, you know, he, he, his, he, his degree in Stanford was in literature, you know, and he could, he could memorize vast amounts of poetry and all this, these things, and he was, um, but his, his spirit was completely broken by, by his own father, who was a very harsh, really harsh. Uh, robber baron type of businessman in the lumber business and they so they sent him off to uh, he was kind of frail you know and they sent him off to live on this ranch in Northern California to try to make a man out of him and um, and he uh, he just succumbed I mean he you know he, he liked that but then he went back and he just took this flunky position in this, in this business where he sat at a calculator all day, every day, adding and subtracting numbers and, you know, drank himself to death. And so it's, it's, it's a terrible story. It's a sad story. Uh, on the other hand, on my mother's side, which is which is the Piazzoni, my, my father was English, Chatham, okay, first Earl of Chatham, William Pitt. So, you know, uh, and, and on my mother's side, they were uh, uh, Swiss Italian peasants, which is why I'm comfortable sleeping under a trestle and going to dinner in a castle. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but my on, on my mother's side. Uh, my grandfather came, was born in Switzerland, came to America in about 1886, uh, probably one of the early travelers on the Transcontinental Railroad, by the way, um, when he was 14 years old. And his brother was also an artist who died very young. Um, and, uh, you know, he spent the rest of his life in San Francisco, in California. And that's where he did all his work. And it's, it, it's brilliant work. I mean, it's, it's unlike anything that anyone else ever did. I mean, it's, you know, so I have the advantage of having been, un, come under the influence um, at an early age of someone who was truly a, a great artist. Um, so growing up, we had his paintings in the house. Um, there was, uh, uh, in not only my immediate family, but in my, amongst my aunts, uncles, cousins, and so forth, there was a general attitude in that, um, that art and artists mattered. And as I say, my grandfather was truly a great painter. And so that's what I saw growing up, was, was his paintings. And naturally, um, that affected me, and it was the single strongest influence um, in, uh, on me and in my work. So um, this is a really famous image, a f photograph of... Uh, uh, my grandfather by Ansel Adams. He's up on a scaffold that was built especially for him to paint these murals that were in the San Francisco Public Library. They were installed in 1931 and 1932. And um, 
you can see the way the picture's lit, the skylight is right above. These things are like 10, 10 or 12 feet high, um, very stylized. There are 10 panels. There was uh, five called The Land, which are, which are pictured in here. And on the other wall, it was called The Sea. And um, it was uh, in one of his uh, published portfolios. And it's a, it's a fabulous photograph. And um, so years ago, I, um, after Ansel had passed away, and I actually knew Ansel too, um, uh, I called the trust in California, it's in Carmel, and I asked if uh, um, they had a copy of this available uh, because at, 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 there were one or two portfolios, and this was one where um, somebody convinced Ansel to destroy the negative. So this is re very rare. So I said, you wouldn't have a proof that you could possibly uh, have for sale. And they said, yeah, we do. We actually do have one. And I said, well, that's fantastic. I said, well, how much, how much would it cost? And the lady said, ten thousand dollars. <laughs> I said, well, that's well, that's nice, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. Well, some year, years later, um, I have a relationship with a with an art dealer in um, uh, Ketchum, Idaho, uh, John Braschowski. And he called me one day and he said, somebody brought this, this photograph of your grandfather in and he said, he said, I thought maybe you'd like to have it. I said, John, yeah, I'd like to have it. I said, I, I said but I, I also happen to know what they're, what they're worth. And he said, well, it doesn't matter. He says, I'm giving it to you anyway. So he packed it up and sent it to me. So it was quite a lovely gesture. So now I, um, this little sketch box was a box that I used when I did my very first painting when I was seven. Um, however, it was, it, it was one of my grandfather's sketch boxes. And uh, he lived with us during the Second World War. And um, he, he normally lived with his, uh, uh, his uh, younger daughter and her husband and they were and he was doing work for the army in, in Canada. So Papa came to live with us from about 1942 until um, the war was over. And <laughs> so this was my Christmas present on my, my third Christmas. <laughs> and it had, um, it had some kind of half used up tubes of paint in it and everything. And of course my mother wouldn't let me touch it. I said, it, I, I was sitting by my bed on a dresser, so I could see it every day, and what I wasn't allowed to do anything with it until I took it to the ranch on, when I was seven. My cousin and I both did our first paintings on the same day. So I used this um, um, from, the time, from that time, this is the sketch box I took with me on my bike, and this is um, you know, and I, I, I now have not used it for a number of years. Um, I painted, this is a painting of the dairy building at the Piazzoni Ranch. And I painted on the back of the box when I was about maybe 14, 15 years old. Maybe, maybe, maybe younger. It's not, it's not dated or anything. But it's got a nice little uh, thing for the turpentine that clips on. And it's got a, uh, you know, I had with just enough room in there for the for the standard palette that I use with the cadmium reds and the cadmium yellows, cobalt blue, and so forth. And um, so this, you know, it's one of the few material objects I have that have, it really has some meaning to me in a world that that's filled with with material objects. So it's um, it's it's quite a, an artifact. <laughs> Grandfather had high hopes for you. Three yeah. years old. You had three items before you drove a car. <laughs> you had three items. Do you remember what they are? Three items. You've before, told me before I drove a car. Yeah. I had a fishing rod, 
I had a paint box and I had a bike. <laughs> <laughs> that was your whole world, wasn't it? That was my world, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you, if you stop and think about the average, average kids are after school or, you know, playing baseball or doing whatever they, whatever they did, you know, I just took my bike and took, put the, get the paint box, that little paint box there and fishing rod and just took off. And that's what <laughs> I did. You know, I, that's what I did over and over every day, every day, every day. And having seen nothing but my grandfather's paintings, that's all I had to go on. And so a lot of my early work, you know, really so closely resembles his it was a struggle for me to find out who I was. And it, it was very difficult, in fact. And when I got a little, to be a little older, um, got to be a late teenager, for example, and so I had some mobility, had a car, and could, could, could go around to museums or galleries and things, and I began to see other things. I found that I was, um, I was affected by and, inf and became influenced by uh, artists whose sensibility, you might say, was somewhat similar to my grandfather's. For example, there was an American painter named Albert Ryder that I had some affinity for, a very spiritual kind of thing. I love the work of, of uh, James McNeil Whistler, particularly his, his uh, landscapes, um, uh, which were very soft, very beautiful pictures. Um, but it wasn't until um, I did not get to really start traveling until uh, I was in my early 30s. It was the first time I ever got on an airplane and actually flew to New York City. And it was quite an experience. I'd never been out of California other than to drive to Montana. And I was 40 before I got to Europe. And um, but once the, once the window began to open in my early 30s, and I saw uh, in New York, of course, you have um, you know, several stupendous museums. You also are only minutes away from Washington, D.C. or from Boston, so let's say. And you, you go to Washington, now you've got the Smithsonian, the National Gallery, and, and so forth and so on. And so the window started to open for me, and other influences started to come in. I began to see how big the world was and how small I was. And, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> it helped me to, it helped me to build on what I already, I already had a solid foundation that I got from my, thank God that my grandfather was a really solid, great painter. But this getting out in the world allowed me to, 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 to expand and see other possibilities. And all of that together um, really produced what I am today. <laughs> if, you, if you are, are a fisherman and you look at a river, what you're looking for is you are looking for the places that are of interest to you as a fisherman, which is only about 1% of the river. The other 99% of the river doesn't have any fish in it. And a person who doesn't have that ability to critically choose, they call it reading it, reading the river, would just walk up to the bank and throw the line out any old where and will not catch a fish. Well, it's a little bit the same thing in, in choosing, in, in, in the, for me, in landscape painting, is that the landscape is it's ubiquitous. It's all around us, all the time, every day. There's, you, every time you turn your head, it's, it's so, the trick is where's the, where's the kernel of the crux of something? Is it a, is it a moment at, during the day? Is it a moment in the morning? Is it a moment in the evening? Is it a certain something, something that is, is like a pinpoint focus and when I see that somewhere, and I can see it any day, every, everything I, everywhere I go, everywhere, I'm always looking, I'm always 
uh, outside. Um, and if, if there's a, a, a moment that crystallizes into something, as they said, there's something about that. I don't know what it is, but something about that. And then I kind of take a picture of it in my mind. And when I come in here, you'll notice there are no windows in here. The last thing I want in a painting studio is a window, be looking out the window and daydreaming. Now, what I have to do is I have to take that, that picture that I took in my brain and somehow get it out through the ends of my fingers onto this canvas. And in so doing, I am going to, it is going to get transformed or warped through, through that whole process of coming in through the eyes and coming out through the, the fingers. Um, and I'm going to try to recreate something of the essence of that kernel that I took a picture of. Now, I'm not really copying anything. I mean, I'm, I'm making up, because a painting has forms and rhythms and lines and colors and design and all these things which I'm going to invent. And, um, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm inventing it, my, my, my map is in my brain. The, there's that kernel of the thing that I saw. And I don't know how else to explain it. Well, <clears throat> generally speaking, um, you know, one of the things you have to remember is you've got a certain um, area that needs to be covered. So you have to kind of be aware of how much material you're going to need to do that. And so it's easier to mix. Um, <clears throat> this is just, of course, going to be an absolute basic first step blocking in. Um, and many, many moons of work will come after this. But you have to start somewhere, and I like to start fairly quickly. It's a little bit different than some other people do, because I view, I, I view my enemy as being the blank canvas, just as I view a blank piece of paper, my enemy as a writer. So you got to get something on the canvas, even if it's wrong, it doesn't matter. One of the tremendous advantages of oil paint is that um, <clears throat> you can make corrections throughout the entire process. Very different, for example, than watercolor where, or in lithography. You put something on that paper, if you haven't thought it through first, you're doomed. You can't change it. But here, with oil paint, you can. And I, I actually credit this is, a, this is pretty odd, but this is true. I actually credit having read a, an essay about, um, not Sargent, but uh, Thomas Gainsborough, who was, a, who was a, uh, an English portrait painter. The essay concerned itself with why, why were Gainsborough's portraits, which were just formal, uh, portraits much like hundreds of other artists, why did they have more life than just the ordinary hack uh, painting? And I read, he described his method, which, which was he would have the model pose and the canvas would be, let's just say, he's going to paint a life-size portrait of a person standing. He would, his goal was to block that in in no more than two hours, as quickly as he could. The value of that was that <clears throat> there's no stiffness to it. It had looseness, it had spontaneity. Now, when he was done, what he did was he, he went, he dismissed the, the sitter, he would take his palette knife and scrape, the paint, scrape everything off that he'd just done. Well, because the canvas has a texture, he left a ghost image on the canvas of the position of the arm, the fate, you know, and all that. Then he would come back in 
have the sitter come back, you know, two to three days later, start to begin to add and refine details. So it's a system that um, that I, I I saw the value of it, and so I use it. Traditionalists would be horrified by what I'm doing here. But I'm quite happy with it. To, we're not, we're not, um, we're only doing one thing now. We're not developing color. We're not developing um, spatial depth. We're going to do one thing, and that is we're identifying the position, the two dimensional position of objects, this way and this way. And that's why this, this first uh, procedure. Uh, it's very simple. They say that um, that uh, that a painting is two percent inspiration and ninety eight percent hard work, and I can vouch for that. It's kind of exciting at this point because it's just starting. I don't know what I'm going to do, but and it won't get exciting again until the last few days, about a year from now. <laughs> I see a lot of times in the, if you want to call it that, in the artistic community, like in this little town, you know, people whose heroes are not strong. You know, they, they select somebody at random to be their hero who's not a powerful, strong person. And so they're, 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 they're kind of negatively impacting themselves by doing that, you know. And so, I mean, I, I, was, I was just, you know, born under a star. <laughs> yeah, cool. All right. Okay. okay. Well, that's that. That was a great that's set. Lecture for today. <laughs>